Hi, everyone, and welcome to another special edition of the VLGA Connect. It is my pleasure today to be joined by Catherine Arndt, the CEO of the VLGA. Hi, Catherine. Hi there, Chris. How are you going today? Very well, thank you. And, and you're here to join me, I know, with some excitement to speak with our special guest, Ken Smith, who's the Dean and CEO of ANZOG. And we're talking about reimagining government. And a lot of the thinking that's being done since, uh, since we were all hit by a pandemic last year, and I'm sure Ken's got all the answers for us <laughs> on how we can avoid the mistakes of the past. Hi, Ken. Welcome to the program. Hi, Chris. Hi, Catherine. Uh, it's great to be with you. Ken, perhaps just start for the uninitiated. Tell us about ANZOG and what it stands for and, and, and what its um, uh, line of work is. Yeah, it's the Australia and New Zealand School of Government. So it um, is a body owned by the, the 10 governments, the, the Australia and New Zealand government and the, the um, eight states and territories. And uh, uh, it's a network with 15 universities. And so fundamentally, we're about understanding demand from government and then providing a range of education, thought leadership and research and advisory services uh, to government. We've been in place for about uh, 20 years. Um, the first dean was Alan Fells, uh, uh, famous from the ACCC time. The second was uh, Gary Banks, and I'm the third. But um, unlike um, Alan and Gary, I've come from a, a state government background primarily, and that was um, uh, particularly for the last 30 years with the Queensland government. And Ken, does the work of ANZOG focus um, at the elected representative level, as well as I know you do run a lot of programs for senior bureaucrats. Hmm. Is there any focus um, of the work that you do at ANZOG on that elected representative arm? Yeah, it's, it, it, as you said, Catherine, it's mainly been um, directed at senior bureaucrats and other, other bureaucrats that um, are involved you know, within government. Um, we've um, done some work, but it's been variable with both um, uh, elected officials, uh, uh, ministers and, um, and political staff. And we've actually um, probably our research and advisory work has done more in that space. So there are books being um, developed for example, on the role of chiefs of staff and the role of, uh, of political staff and how they um, uh, cross into uh, the role of public servants and the relationship between public servants, uh, ministers and uh, political staff. Obviously, you know, at, at, um, uh, within local government, that relationship is even closer than it is in, you know, many of the states and territories and at a Commonwealth level where there's a constant um, interface between um, senior officials, but also, you know, lots of officers of council and, and those elected uh, to council, as well as, um, no doubt, uh, as is occurring and has occurred really since about 1975, a, a growing influence of um, political advisors. And um, in, a, in a system that's, I'll, I'll, I'll say, Westminster-like um, in its focus, how that has changed the balance of, um, of relationships between those three areas. And um, I know not all local governments would necessarily have, you know, political advisors, but the bigger local government uh, definitely do. Um, and that, that um, I suppose that, that issue would be quite important for local government as it is for the state and, uh, and Commonwealth government. Yes, and, and you're, you're right there, Ken. I mean, Victoria is a little different to perhaps Queensland in, in you know, we have 79 municipalities. Hmm. Um, the scope of services uh, delivered by local government in Victoria is not as extensive as the larger municipalities in Brisbane where, yep. in fact, the councillors do have staff who advise them. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting comparison you make. I think uh, local government is unlike um, the other levels of government in terms of the role of the elected representative. Mm -hmm. And I was really pleased to note in um, your cohort of students in the 
think it's the Masters of Public Administration program yep. last year actually chose a local government project um, to do an evaluation of. And that was, in fact, one that the VLGA runs, and that was our local women leading change program. Mm -hmm. We received some funding from the state government to encourage women to stand for election in local mm -hmm. government elections. So yep. it was great to see that that got picked up. Um, and, and will be a really useful tool, I think, in helping to increase diversity uh, at that level. But um, Chris, perhaps it's time to ask um, Ken a little bit more about some of the programs. And we were really interested um, to learn more about the Reimagining Government series that Anzog has uh, rolled out. Yeah, just to comment on that, that issue. I mean, I think it's really clear that there's amazing variability within our local government system. As you've said, there are some regional governments in Australia um, that operate under local government legislation or, you know, the equivalent of, um, of CBD city councils. But Brisbane, for example, um, is as big as um, some of the states and territories in terms of its budget and remit. And as, a, as um, a regional government has been in place since, I think, the mid-20s, 1920s, not 2020s. So you've got a long-term, diverse um, uh, and, and actually quite large body that manages, you know, a very big area. And then, obviously, there are local governments which are... Um, smaller population, even though they might be large geographic um, sort of footprint. So there's an incredible variation there in the nature of local government, you know, in Australia. And, um, and, and that's important to consider when you're, you're looking at the future of, um, of government. And I suspected this conversation could go in a number of directions. And you, you've also reminded me of the scandal that's going on in England at the moment around lobbyists and, mm. you know, to, to, on the advisor sort of angle. And I think that's another conversation we could potentially have because it, it exercises my mind about what's different given our system is so strongly based on the English system. What is different that's allowed that to happen there? Uh, and um, I don't know whether you've turned your mind to whether we're at risk of a similar sort of issue or whether our compliance and, uh, um, uh, you know, interest uh, schemes are stronger. Look, I, I, I think the the Greens Hill um, case, as we, we would now call it, is going yeah. to provide a lot of lessons about how systems operate and um, what the value is of a, uh, a professional, independent, non-partisan public service vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, where that intersects with uh, lobbying arrangements where it in intersects with the political system. But clearly, um, the reason we need to reimagine government and rethink government is um, it's changed so dramatically. So the home of Westminster has real challenges in how Westminster and Whitehall operates when you find that, um, as reported in, in, the, in the media, that um, laudable objectives by government to uh, employ people from the private sector have potentially created tensions within the system where those people have continued to be able to work privately as well as with government and where there is a conflict between their government roles and significant shareholding interest. This isn't, you know, a few shares. I mean, the, mm. the, the person that was in that sort of chief procurement um, position had um, reportedly about five million pounds of shares in the company that was then contracting back to government. So this, this raises huge issues about um, integrity, about why that got to that point, because there are... Um, for all spheres of government, and sometimes we think they, you know, they get in the way, but there are incredible um, what uh, uh, John Keane calls monetary agencies to the de democracy. So there are there's coverage of corruption commissioners, of 
you know, of all uh, spheres of government. There are uh, coverage of auditors general. There are coverage uh, by ombudsmen, by freedom of information commissioners, by privacy commissioners. So there's a whole set of monitoring institutions that are meant to provide some confidence about the, the integrity of the system. But the integrity of the system can only be determined um, by making sure that leaders in systems, and, and Chris, I know you've come from you know, a, an elected uh, position in local government, but we would argue that there has to be much more ingrained um, institutional integrity underpinning systems that um, people need to uh, need to think about um, ensuring that what they do is in the public interest and that they maintain public trust and that they think about these conflicts of interest very, very carefully. And it's not about rules. It's not about whether this technically is a criminal offence or not. That's not the test. The test is more fundamentally, is this the right thing to do? And, and am I operating in the public interest or am I operating in a sectional interest, you know, and worse, the worst part of that is where that's potentially a personal interest for me, rather than, um, you know, testing this out to make sure that, you know, it's an interest for, you know, the community that we're, we're there to serve. So three things, if I may, Catherine, before you ask your question, just to pick up on uh, some things Ken said there. One, anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, a quick Google of David Cameron lobbying scandal will find you uh, myriad information about what's been happening uh, in London. Uh, secondly, Catherine, I think this is fodder for a potential uh, panel discussion around these sorts of issues and, and, you know, could it happen here? or is our system strong enough to prevent it? Uh, and Ken, just to disabuse you, I was not an elected rep, I was a CEO, not oh, with, CEO, sorry. with being an elected <laughs> rep, uh, but I just thought I'd better uh, yeah. clarify that. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah, clear up the record. <laughs> Look, um, what I, I just wanted to ask Ken and, and you know, be really interested in your thoughts about how we achieve that um, level of in integrity and also um, insight in our elected representatives when, of course, the system is uh, based on an adversarial um, process of, of elections and campaigning, usually on single policy issues which um, from a local government perspective, of course, have no place in the council chamber once someone is elected. But that makes it, um, you know, extraordinarily difficult though for those councillors to understand um, that their role is to make almost governance decisions on behalf of a, a range of stakeholders in the community. But yet then the election process comes around again and it just it, it almost requires that these councillors, because in fact the community who vote them in don't necessarily understand um, the role of elected representatives at that level. But I think the same um, observations can also be made at, at both the state and, and at federal level as well. So mm -hmm. one of the things you talked about was the role of advisors, and I do recall that Nicholas Reese from the School of Government at um, mm. Melbourne Uni and also a councillor, a sitting councillor, yep. in fact, Deputy Mayor, Deputy Mayor. Mm. of um, Melbourne, um, wrote a paper on, it was on the, our federal model of government and one of the recommendations that he made in that, he, he co-authored it and I just can't recall whether it was Tom Daly or, or some other academic, um, so I do apologise for that person not remembering who that was but he did comment on the important role that advisors play and political staffers and the fact that often the level of understanding of and and even the lack of um, professional development that some of those staff bring with them creates risks for the elected representatives that they're advising um, and there is now the McKinnon Institute here, yeah. and I'm, I'm sure you've heard of them, I think, mm -hmm. who are trying to look at um, ways that really target sitting elected representatives, but also potential elected representatives in the future to try and instill that, that mm -hmm. um, all of those things that you just spoke about. 
Yeah, and and Catherine, I, I think it's really important to put on record a couple of things. I mean, in terms of trust in government, again and again, there is greater trust by the community in government that's closest to them. So the, the decline in trust in Australia, which has been well recorded over a period of time, the major decline has been at federal level. The, at state level, it's sort of, um, there's been a small decline, but it's bumped along, you know, at a particular level. But the levels of trust within local government are very, very high. And so, you know, there's an old saying that, you know, standing for election is like a poem sitting in government is a piece of literature and the difference is, you know, the narrative. So I think, you know, the, the electoral process is really important. Competition in the electoral process is really important. But I think the community expect that once people are elected, they're elected to govern. And particularly now with four-year fixed terms, that there has to be this switch and we all need to pivot in our lives, like, you know, we've pivoted with COVID and we've moved online and, you know, away from face-to-face -face arrangements. The pivot for um, people who, you know, are part of our elected arrangement at any level is the pivot from the politics of an electoral cycle to the authority that comes with governing. Yes. And, and and getting people to make that pivot is really important that it's no it's no good if you're there you know for a four year term and you've got particular responsibilities legally and with authority you can't keep on campaigning for four years because people expect good governance and good governance requires certain sort of principles so i think there there is there's there's a real role for VLGA with elected officials and you know, obviously with, um, with staff to build that capability of understanding their responsibilities during that period of governing, because that, that narrative, you know, becomes, you know, all important. It's not denying there will always be, you know, a political process and that's going to be contestable, et cetera. But it's at the point you come to governing that you need to think very, very differently. And, and you know, the electoral process is almost... Um, about how you deal with sectional interests. Yeah. Then when you're in government, good government is about the public interest and, and good trust comes, I mean, increased trust comes when you balance and clearly operate in the public interest rather than sectional interest. Because if you just operate in a sectional interest, what we find is that the, the issues you know, impacting on any community change quite dramatically over time. Mm -hmm. And it's it's even speeding up. So therefore, you can't just hold on to, you know, a, 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 like a position that 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 might have been, you know, part of a sectional interest view at that point in time. Those issues change. And you can see at the moment, there's massive change occurring in opinions to climate change. You know, mm -hmm. as a result of bushfires, as a result of, you know, what's happening internationally, you know, you know, so, you know, the US throw a rock in the pool, they elect a new president, the new president has a very different view, it ripples, you know, throughout the world. And so uh, I think the environment in which we're operating is fast sort of changing. And it means that people, you know, need to be able to then understand those changes and then communicate effectively why they're taking a particular position um, and what that, you know, what that, um, why that's in, you know important for you know a particular you know local community that they're accountable to. And and I are you suggesting Ken that that perhaps organically uh, elected representatives will start to understand this this more and more because of the pace of those changes that you just spoke about. Um, or I mean we also talked about their role once elected and I've got to make the observation that sometimes the process of actually being pre-selected is so brutal that by the time they get to that elected stage they're they're pretty battle weary as it is and sometimes it's the last person um, left standing uh, so that of course raises a whole other conversation about um, you know about that process. Chris should we go back to the re 
Imagining Government series. And did you have? I, some... I just worry that that's rather bland and boring compared to what we've been talking about. But um, basically, Ken, last year you brought a whole heap of experts together in a series of panel discussions about reimagining government in the current environment. Let's cut to the chase. What did you decide at the end? Look, uh, and what we've been talking about is is consistent with that. Um, I think one of the themes emerging was that um, that government, uh, an important government principle is subsidiarity. Um, and that we can, you know, you, the principle of subsidiarity is, is down to an individual and household level and, you know, government intervening in the best interests of, of, of you know, that unit and only intervening when, it, when it's going to improve the outcomes for that unit. So a, a, big, a big challenge for um, really national government and state government is to understand how there should be greater flexibility and responsiveness at a local level and engagement, that, that it's not you know, one size fits all, Chris. It's, 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 it's actually about um, how do you ensure that the issues impacting on different communities then impact on the budget, the 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 way that that uh, uh, that uh, service infrastructure operates, and that that can't simply be a one size fits all out of Canberra or out of Melbourne for that that matter. The needs of those communities, you need to readjust to what is occurring in those communities. And that's so if it's a, you know, if it's an indigenous community or if it's a community that, that is adjusting um, as a result of major economic adjustments like the La Trobe Valley, you know, you need to, you, you, you know, if you're gonna be responsive, um, the, the issues occurring in Melbourne CBD now are very different from the La Trobe Valley, and that's very different from, you know, the Thursday Island community, which is very different from, you know, what's yeah. happening in different parts. So I think, you know, one of the big challenges of reimagining government is, in fact, as Churchill famously said, you know, democracy is hopeless. I mean, I'm, you know, uh, but it's the best form of any government that, that we've got. Going back to that trust issue, the really interesting thing from my perspective, AJ Brown did some really interesting research over a period of time on this. People are more concerned about their engagement and we all get caught up in saying, oh, you know, we're over-governed by having three levels of government. In fact, the, the evidence coming from the community is they saw logic in four levels of government in Australia local, regional, state, and national. Now that confounded a lot of people. That was the major um, uh, sort of, that was the major feedback from the community. It was the, the, the biggest majority of people saw no problem with four levels of government. They didn't think that the levels of government equated with efficiency. They, they equate that with responsiveness. And on some issues, People want greater say, you know, in what is occurring within their community. And you could define that as NIMBYism, or you could define it that people in those areas really um, are vitally concerned about their input and their capacity for input. So I think one of the things about reimagining government is actually reimagining and developing the, the responsiveness to the community. And the good things that local government have done in a range of areas is actively engage the community in problem solving. And it doesn't mean that you just get NIMBY, act, you know, NIMBY sort of um, feedback. If you engage people, if, the, you know, if our democratic principles are not just representative, that is you vote once every four years and you get what you vote and then you can vote them out. But if it's actually... Um, a dem democracy based on ongoing engagement, informing people and then allowing people to, to be involved and have their views heard res respectfully, trust will actually increase. And if you have confidence in the community, the community will get beyond you know, nimbyism. I, I don't want to be over simplistic. I know that you know, I don't want that four-storey building next to me and all that sort of stuff. But 
I, I think if you engage with the community and, and they understand the trade-offs, you can get really very good results. And um, we know that more and more, you know, rather than simply, you know, sort of putting that freeway through that corridor and don't worry about consulting with everyone, you can get lots of really good feedback that says, well, have you thought about this rather than that? Have you thought about putting parks under a V line rather than put the rails along the ground? All, all that sort of stuff. The community, you know, um, have a, a lot of good things to say, and if you if you engage people properly um, and inform as well as not just ask people what they think, but inform people's thinking, that can actually really you know assist the the, the whole process. I think the COVID environment has just reinforced that you need the community to be informed and on side. Otherwise, people aren't going to self-isolate. They're not going to do all the things that are going to protect the community. But as everyone, you know, all leaders have said, the response to COVID is not about treatment. It's actually about engaging with the community to get the community to accept a responsibility. But that's so, you know, um, as you know, when we were running out of water, if you engage with the community, they'll reduce their water consumption. And, and just going back to that, um, it was um, AJ Brown from Griffith Uni, um, mm-hmm. yeah, who did that research. I think we should c- clarify just for our viewers that when we talk about four levels of government, it's my understanding that that doesn't necessarily in itself mean four levels of elected representatives necessarily, but picking up on your point, it's about almost that direct participation in our democratic processes by citizens themselves directly, as opposed to necessarily uh, just through representative Um, democratic processes such as, you know, uh, elected officials. And that's a really interesting um, discussion in itself, I think, and and perhaps for another day. But that opportunity, we've certainly seen it through COVID and the use of technology. There are ways for citizens to directly participate in democratic decision-making processes. In fact, the Local Government Act in Victoria has incorporated the the new act, uh, the principle of um, deliberative engagement as as a prescriptive requirement now um, in local government's decision making. And that, of course, can occur in a variety of different ways and, and doesn't necessarily mean that those elected officials at that level of government are doing the engagement, but as a collective, their council is engaging yeah. with the community. Going back to the reimagining government, it is about um, engagement. It's about how you create services, and you know there there are there are there are challenges in the digital environment, but there's great opportunities. There are great opportunities. I mean, I, I, I was talking to a friend the other day. You know what what it's done um, in terms of telehealth. I mean, like you know, like I can now um, you know link in with my GP by phone. I can get the script as a text, including repeat, whereas before one had to go into the, 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 um, you know, the GP surgery. So COVID has actually brought incredible range of innovation and confirmed that um, by engaging people and engaging their logical behaviours, we can actually not, I mean, this isn't too dramatic, I don't think, we can actually save people's lives. I mean, if, you know, one role of government is community safety. And when I was involved, you know, it was different in Queensland at the time, um, but it was cyclones and floods, etc. We were still working off um, informing people, um, uh, you know, the sit reps came to political leaders, political leaders, you know, an hour later would stand in front of the media. But by the time the sit reps were prepared and they went to political leaders and they went into the media, there could have been four or five hours difference from when we got the initial information. Mm. What technology has done, I mean, the bushfire stuff is amazing. So so information that was previously only available to people in emergency services who would prepare the sit reps is now available on people's phones. Yeah, that's right. So people can make rational decisions as to whether they should leave, they should stay. 
So the technology itself and, and the trust with people that they will make logical decisions, and in the main, people do make really logical decisions, I think, you know, it has the potential to improve community safe, safety massively. And so a lot of that is about, you know, it, it's not simply saying, you know, here's the information, you make a decision. It has to be backed up then by informing people, as you said, Catherine, so people can make informed decisions based on the information that's available to them. But I think that's amazing development. Now, so there's all the stuff, you know, about Facebook and use of privacy information and stuff like that. But then, you know, there's always a two-edged sword to this. There's some really positive things that actually will improve community safety, that will improve public health and other opportunities by empowering people. And, and that, that, you know, to me, you know, I don't want to be polyannerish about this, but it, it's, it, it's really, you know, really important that we see that there are, there are two sides to this and that if we look to, you know, protecting people on the privacy and, you know, the regulatory side, which is really important, but on the other side, see the great benefits that will come from this. Going back to Chris's point, it changes the, the relationship between um, uh, people, you know, public servants and the community because they're then public servants are not the gatekeepers they're facilitating access to information that empowers people if you and i think you that's remember. a nice way to, to probably wrap up our conversation <laughs> and i know chris you had lots of other questions one of the things that i'd love to have ken back on the program to talk about and explore is then the reluctance that there does still seem to be from other levels of government, particularly the federal and state levels of government, when it comes to this concept of subsidiarity and the role of local government and um, citizens at that level. But I, as I said, that's probably a whole other conversation. Right. Okay. Thanks, Catherine. I've, I've got a mental list of about three or four things out of that that would be exploring, Ken. If you're if you're happy to come back at some stage, we'd love to talk to you again on the program. But thank you for those insights today. It's been very, very uh, useful and I'm sure our audience uh, would find it so as well. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks so much, Ken. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly enjoyed it. I know Catherine did. A wide-ranging discussion with Ken Smith, the Dean and CEO of ANZOG, on reimagining government and so much more. We will have Ken back to talk about some of those other issues that came out of today's conversation. This has been a special edition of VLGA Connect. We'll see you again very soon.